Hey there, this is Andrew Ross Sorkin of the New York Times. Thank you so very, very much for joining us uh, on our weekly uh, deal book debrief call where we try to make some sense of uh, what often feels like a senseless world. I'm joined uh, by Michael Dolmerset, of course, from Dealbook, and we have a very special guest who's gonna be joining us uh, today, uh, Tom Friedman, a New York Times opinion columnist, and I'm happy to call uh, a friend and one of the biggest brains I know uh, who's been spending a lot of time thinking about uh, the world we're living in right now and the world uh, as it may be in the future. Uh, he's written a fabulous column uh, that I would encourage everybody to get a chance to read called Post-Pandemic, Here's How America Rises Again. Uh, that assumes a lot of things uh, about getting there, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, quick housekeeping, uh, this is an audio-only call, so if you're on Zoom and you're looking for video, uh, you're not going to be seeing us. You can listen to us, and uh, we do that in part because I know a lot of people out there have work to do and other things, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a great way just to be part of this conversation. Uh, we are going to have uh, and open this conversation up to questions and get to as many as we possibly can. Uh, you can submit them uh, right now uh, in the Q&A window, and also a reminder, this call is recorded, and we'll make a replay available in tomorrow's deal book as well as on uh, social and on nytimes.com. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for joining us. You are unmuted by host, okay? You've been unmuted. You're there, Tom. Can you hear us? Yes, I hear you just fine. Thanks, thanks for being here. Um, we have a lot to talk about. And as I mentioned, you have this great column that talks about the world post-pandemic, and I want to get to that. But before we do, I think a lot of us are, are spending our times, and I know you've spent a lot of time talking to scientists and people in the health community, as well as business leaders who are thinking about just what it even means to reopen, to get to the post-pandemic world. Um, what are you thinking about in terms of what a timeline realistically looks like right now and how we get there? Well, Andrew, let me, um, first of all, thanks. Um, it's a treat to be with you uh, and Michael uh, and our Times audience, Dealbook audience here. Um, and I hope everyone is staying safe and well. Um, uh, back in 2008, um, I wrote a book called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Um, and it was really a book about uh, the natural world and how to think about leveraging nature and capitalism as we go forward to make both a greener world and a more prosperous world together. And I found that the people I came to know in writing about the natural world and the insights I got from writing that book have really uh, uh, helped me today through uh, understanding this crisis. Uh, I will say um, it's, uh, that book was actually number one in the New York Times bestseller list for three weeks. And then this bank called uh, Lehman Brothers went under and uh, it completely disappeared. So I, uh, I've i been thinking of this kind of bookend of these two crises a lot. And, and that has really helped shape my, uh, my thinking. So I start with the fact that um, we are up against a, a challenge. You know, uh, the president's called an enemy. We're in a war. Uh, and, but with a, 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 an, an enemy, a, a challenge, most people have actually never encountered before. And that's the natural world. Uh, it's mother nature. And um, as one of my teachers, uh, going actually back to that book, Rob Watson likes to say, um, mother nature is just chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is. So you can't talk her up, you can't talk her down, you can't say mother nature, we're having a little recession here. Could you give us a break? She's gonna do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate. And mother nature always bats last and she always bats a thousand. So do not mess with mother nature. So that, where, where I think the president got into a little trouble in the beginning is that he tended to look at the market. And if the market was going up in response to anything he was doing vis-a-vis -vis the virus, he thought he was succeeding. So for him, the market was really the barometer. And the, but he, he didn't really understand mother nature because mother nature actually doesn't report to work at 9.30. She doesn't open at 9.30. She doesn't close at four. And she doesn't take Saturdays and Sundays off. So while he was looking at the market, and many of us were, Mother Nature was actually quietly, silently, exponentially, inexorably, and mercilessly spreading COVID-19 virus. And she's still doing that. As a result of that, where I always start the analysis is with the fact that there are only two ways to escape 
Mother Nature's relentless, merciless spreading of a virus. And viruses are, are one of the tools she uses, along with forest fires and floods and different weather extremes, to sort out the survival of the fittest and who should get their DNA into the next generation. So this is a, we're up against a very different enemy here, this thing called Mother Nature. Um, you know, with the Nazis and the Japanese, we could actually outmobilize them. With the Russians and the USSR, the Soviet Union, we could actually out innovate and out invest them. But with Mother Nature, you can do neither. So in the face of a pandemic, there are just two ways out. One is a vaccine, and the other is herd immunity where basically 60 or 70 percent of us get it and the virus runs out of hosts to infect. Those are the only two ways to escape her quiet, relentless, and merciless march with this virus to sort out the survival of the fittest. So if that's the case then, really what we're looking at, what everyone's really trying to explore is what uh, Dr. David Katz has called total harm minimization. How do we harm our, our public health, our society's health, and our economic health, how do we minimize the harm to both and maximize our ability to pivot from this shelter and home place to, um, uh, to back to business? And I'll just end here by saying, the way I think of it, Andrew, is that we're all now walking around with broken legs from this virus. What some of the market optimists kind of seem to have in their head is we're going to go from broken leg to sprinters again. I think we're going to go from broken legs to people in casts, walking around with canes and crutches. That is to say, when I think about where the economy is going to be, absent a vaccine or herd immunity in America for the next 18 two year, months, two years, however long it will take, I think I, I simply ask one question to every single business. What does your business look like? when every one of your customers, suppliers, partners, and employees is coming to work or knocking at your door, wearing a mask, wearing plastic gloves, and standing six feet away. Tell me what your business looks like with those kind of customers, suppliers, and employees, and I'll tell you what kind of business you're gonna have and what kind of economy we're gonna have. That's a, a chilling, thought, Tom, um, truly chilling, because what you're really talking about is this taking, taking 18 months, taking two years, which I think is a, a much longer timeline than, than, than a lot of people in this country uh, clearly want, but even expect, no? Well, again, because the mind, you know, I, that's why I go back to Mother Nature. I always start there, Andrew, and it's a place that very few people start their analysis. Most people, you know, there's, there's the two biggest forces on the planet are mother nature and father greed, the market and mother nature. And they contend for influence. We have lived in a world where the market has been the biggest disciplining force for the most part. And mother nature only bears her fangs with the occasional hurricane and storm and whatnot, but those come and go. But we've never faced her full wrath you know, my, my daughter, uh, Natalie, is the executive producer of All Things Considered a Weekend on NPR, so I never miss the show. And this Sunday, they had a roundup, Easter Sunday, um, on uh, pastor's Easter sermons. And the last one was Michael Elliott at the National Cathedral. And he ended his Easter sermon singing, he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the whole wide world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Well, just substitute he for she. Mother Nature, for the first time, she got the whole world in her hands. Right. Boy, chemistry, biology, and physics, some days, man, they, I look at my yard, I look at the beauty, you know, that they come together in Mother Nature. But she has a downside that is relentless right. and it's merciless and exponential. And for the first time, the entire world, Andrew, is experiencing that. And so it so fights against every, because markets go up and they go down. Right. They recover when you feed them money. You know, they, they do it, but she doesn't. 
And that's why I, I, I start with her. I'm so glad I wrote about it because when you start with her, your analysis goes in a very different direction. Well, let me ask you a question then about that though, which is, you know, in certain parts of the country, New York, uh, where you're based on, on, on the East Coast, uh, we've, had a lot of exper we've had a lot of exper experience with this. Uh, there are other parts of the country that haven't. And so people talk about, you know, can you open other parts of the country? Do other, do, you know, do people in certain parts of the country not feel the same risk, uh, even though the risk may, may, may be real? And, and sort of how you think about, how you think about that and the idea of people wearing masks everywhere uh, and, and we were talking before the, the, the call started, you know, what do we do with kids? Should kids go back to school if, 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 if they can ultimately spread this and then come home? And if, you, if they don't go back to school, then a parent's gonna have to work from home to take care of the kids and what does that do to the economy? So how, how are you sort of walking or, or thinking through those permutations? Uh, well, a friend of mine at uh, McKinsey um, has coined two terms, uh, Coronians and Covidians. And um, Coronians are people who have uh, had the briars and, and um, become uh, um, immune um, and, uh, and survived it. And, and Covidians are people who haven't. And um, I think you're gonna see, uh, hopefully the Coronians um, go back to work first, go back into the most uh, uh, needed uh, occupations and, and industries, food distribution, healthcare, obviously, um, uh, transportation and communication. But um, uh, I, I worry um, uh, about all the issues you're, you're um, raising, Andrew, because the mind, the mind goes back to uh, some reversion to the mean quickly. Or, or if we just feed it enough um, stimulus or, or, or bailout, because we're, we're thinking at it from, we're so trained and ingrained to think of these kind of market solutions. And um, I think you can get into a lot of trouble uh, thinking about this that way and not thinking at it um, with, with this kind of mother nature as your foundational launching point. That said, um, kids do have to go to school. You know, I, I just step back, Andrew, and I don't want to like depress people, but you know, I, I lived in a civil war in Beirut for five years from 1979, uh, mostly to 1984. And um, I learned uh, two things living in a civil war. One is um, the thin uh, veneer of civilization. I actually watched it come off. Um, I actually watched a car speeding backwards 50 miles an hour down the street, uh, fleeing, you know, conflict. I never forgot that. But the other thing I learned um, in covering a civil war is that nobody's keeping score. That is your community can get hit with COVID-19 and then have a hurricane come through. There's nobody keeping score. There's no one saying, okay, we've, we've given you this plague, but we promise no more plagues. You know what I mean? And that's why you have to, when you're dealing with Nate, you have to be so good in your thinking, so, so apolitical and so relying on the best expertise you can, because if you veer from that, if you veer from that, like mother nature will find any crack in your thinking. And so um, that's, that's what we have to be doing right now is we think about what do we do with kids? What do we do with workers? Who gets bailed out? We need, you need to set all politics aside because any, any deviation from the most serious thinking, she will find and she will exploit it. And so I don't have a simple answer for what to do with, with, with kids. I, I'm thinking about so many things at once because it's everybody everywhere of all ages all the time. And I think the best thinking is going, going on now are those people, I'll give you a couple of, of extremes. Uh, one is Amnon Shashua, who is a real teacher of mine. Amnon um, uh, is the Israeli computer scientist who invented, uh, he and a colleague, Mobileye, which was bought by Intel, uh, the, the um, autonomous driving company. And uh, you know, Amnon has, has put out several studies for, for Israel, but to apply to anywhere. He basically says, look, what we should be doing is um, quarantining everyone, sequestering everyone. I'm 66, so 67 and over, whatever. Um, uh, and those are the most immune vulnerable and, and potentially immune compromised. Just sequester them. Let everybody else out. Let everybody else go back to work and bet, and bet that the number of them that will require hospitalization 
that, that many will get sick, but the number will actually require hospitalization and ICU beds will be less than, less than sign than the number of hospital beds, ICU beds, and respirators you have in your country. That's the just sort of raw uh, math bet he's making. The other bet you see out there is China, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, uh, and, and Korea, the same version of it roughly. And, um, uh, and that's why I start every morning, first thing I do, I warm up my computer and I type in Singapore into Google. I wanna know what, what, a, what a small city state uh, that heavy on authoritarianism uh, that has pivoted to opening, but can do tracking, tracing, sequestering, you know, at a very, very high level, you know, how are they doing? And you see how difficult it is for them, Andrew. They had, I think, 500 new cases today, uh, mostly from foreign workers, but, but they're the gold standard. But it's going to be either one or the other. Either you just make a raw bet on herd immunity, and say, I think we've suppressed it enough now that we have enough hospital beds and IC, ICU units to deal with the most vulnerable, uh, though those who get sick, and we're just gonna sequester the most vulnerable. Tom, you're gonna just gonna have to stay at home. Uh, or you try this middle ground. Now, the middle ground seems to be what Trump is talking about, where we will go back to work, but there will be testing, tracing, sequestering. But are we gonna do it as well as Singapore did? Boy, it sure doesn't feel like it. And so um, I think we're, it's going to get really messy. Well, let me ask you a different question. And, and then I do want to open up to questions because I know so many are, are coming in or flooding in actually as we speak. You know, if, if you think about this as a crisis or pandemic that could last upwards of 18 months to two years as a vaccine and, and maybe an antiviral or antibodies and, or, or herd immunity or, or some solution is reached, the cost of keeping this country going is going to be astronomical because this $2 trillion stimulus is gonna be a drop in the bucket if we have to do this every several months along the way. And so the question I would ask is A, should we be doing that? And B, what does it look like on the other side of doing that in terms of the conversation we're gonna to have to have in this country about taxes on companies, on individuals, um, sort of how we're going to pay for all of this, uh, the idea of winners and losers and bailouts. I mean, how do you think about that? Well, you know, I did a column, uh, which I talked about with you a little on Squawk Box two weeks ago, in which I called for Biden to appoint a national unity government, i.e. to name Republicans, um, uh, uh, not just Democrats in his cabinet. And the reason I wrote that is because I think there are going to be two giant stresses in what I call the AC world. I think there's the BC world before Corona and AC after Corona. And in the AC world, the, uh, there are gonna be two giant stresses. One is on equity. Who got bailed out and who didn't? Um, uh, when we, you know, a lot of people now are just sheltered in place. They're, they're, they're just stunned. Um, they're, they're, um, uh, and, and people are trying to be as helpful to one another as they can. But Andrew, once the lid comes off and people are out, and they say, uh, well, Boeing got, a, B -B -B Boeing got a bailout, and they really, um, and I know Boeing hasn't decided whether or not they're gonna take it, but let's, let's use them as an example. Um, Boeing got a bailout, but um, me, aerospace firm X, I actually managed my balance sheet really well, managed my savings well, didn't have a huge problem like you know the 737 MAX, and I now have to compete against Boeing with their cheap government money, or I own Tom Friedman's favorite Lebanese restaurant in Bethesda. And I don't have a lobbyist in Washington. And, and Boeing got bailed out and I did. The equity issues that are gonna arise from this, Andrew, when people realize who got bailed out and who didn't. I mean, remember the uh, 2008 produced the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street. Imagine what this will produce. So that's one screen I'm worried about. Second is um, the issue around uh, civil liberties. Because just as after 9-11, I wanted to know the person sitting next to me on the airplane was not carrying a bomb. Before I get on an airplane again, I'm going to want to know that they're not carrying COVID-19. Um, and, um, you know, a, a lot of people are just going to say, hey, do whatever you want. Take my temperature. Take my blood before I get on a plane. Um, uh, you know, wear a mask, whatever. Uh, track and trace me. 
that you can know that I met with Andrew for lunch the week before and the waiter we were with, you know, had a brother-in-law I mean, who had COVID-19. I mean, that's what the kind of tracking and tracing by the way they do in Singapore to prevent the spread of the virus absent herd immunity. So we're gonna have a huge set of issues around that. And then how do you pay for this? Well, obviously, I mean, the price of gold has not been going up by accident. People understand that everyone is gonna be debasing their currencies. Now we have counter trends because this is gonna be both deflationary and inflationary at the same time. Um, but we have a Fed that the treasury can issue bonds and the Fed will buy them. That's what's going on basically. But if you're a developing country X, you have no ability to do it. You're just going to print money. And so the debasing of currencies that's going to happen here um, is going to be huge. And who pays? Um, well, that's why I wrote about that in my column yesterday. Let's make sure we're not just bailing out, which we must do, but they're also investing in things that will make us resilient and productive going forward. Otherwise, we would just be burdening the next generation with a massive amount of debt. And the U.S. government would literally just be Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, and a little army, and that's it. Final question from me, just as a follow to this. What do you tell, and then, and then we will, we'll get to everybody's questions. What do you tell people who say the cure is worse than the disease right now? Well, you know, um, I was one of the first people to write that. And um, here's what I simply say. That is a serious question. So let's not treat you know, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is the most uh, inappropriate president uh, I could imagine today. But he is going to be asked, and like other leaders around the world, mayors and governors, well, they're going to have to be asked to answer the biggest who shall live, who shall die question of any president since Harry Truman decided to bomb Hiroshima. And that wasn't about Americans living and dying. It was about Japanese living and dying but it was a life and death question. And that is who shall go out and who shall not? Who shall be encouraged to go out and who shall not? Um, in the next few weeks, when the virus is still out there. And to treat uh, people who think that um, deaths of despair could be far larger than deaths of the, of the coronavirus. To treat them as just unfeeling um, you know, plutocrats is stuff and nonsense in my view. And one must, you know, some things are true even if, even if Donald Trump believes them. And some things are true even if Donald Trump is so maladroit at expressing them. And I'm not telling you where I come out on this question, but I tell you it's a damn serious question. And to treat it as if, it, as if, it, as if the answer is just obvious, one or the other, um, uh, I, I, I find that um, uh, really unfortunate. Fair enough. Thank you for taking my questions, Tom. Let's uh, turn it over uh, to the questions on the phone. I know Michael has been sorting through them. Michael? Yes, Andrew. Hi, Tom. Thanks so much for the really enlightening discussion. Um, as you can imagine, the questions have been coming in really fast and furious on a whole range of topics. Um, I just wanted to start off with a big topic on a lot of people's hands, uh, on a lot of people's minds, is um, about uh, is about. Hold on one second. Um, is about uh, this comes from John via email, and he wants to know uh, your views, Tom, on how COVID nineteen has impacted globalism, both in the near term and in the longer term. Well, John, this is what I would say. Um, I've been a journalist for forty years, and I started in. Uh, um, in London on Fleet Street in 1979. And the biggest thing I've learned in those 40 years, um, 41 years now actually, um, is that um, the biggest mistakes I made as a journalist, uh, as a reporter and a columnist, were whenever I um, uh, started a column or a news story with the following sentence, the world will never be the same again. That can get you in trouble. So um, I uh, remember we had a 1918 pandemic and, um, and where are we today? We're having a global conversation on Zoom. So a lot of people have asked me about the globalization question. And what I would say to you is this, it all goes back to the core issue of 
who gets to define globalization? If globalization is defined as just trade, then globalization's in for a big hit in the short term and probably a big reconfiguring in the long term, because I think there will be a general shortening of supply chains. But if globalization is the ability of individuals, companies, communities, and countries to act globally and interact globally, oh my God, globalization is going to explode. Before this call, I was on a call with um, about 100 um, businessmen throughout the Arab world. Um, if that isn't globalism, I don't know what is. So, and at the same time, the ability to overcome this virus right now is kind of every country for itself, but ultimately, ultimately it's going to require a huge amount of global collaboration and cooperation. So um, I think uh, uh, globalization um, uh, in some ways will, will be diminished and in other ways it will be vastly expanded. I have learned, I mean, the last week I've had conversations with different groups in Santiago, um, uh, uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Istanbul, um, uh, uh, Dubai, um, a couple others. I've actually discovered, uh, I am a Zoom, a Zoomite now or whatever, a, a, a Zoomatic, um, that uh, actually having a Zoom conversation with someone in Dubai and someone in Santiago, as I did yesterday, back to back, it was about 90% as good as going there. So my ability to act globally um, may actually be enhanced as a result of this. So in other words, bottom line, it'll have many different, uh, uh, it'll be both improve and, and disprove and fix and enhance and, and diminish. It'll go do everything in, in multiple directions. There won't be one answer to that question. Got it. Um, and a lot of readers have been asking about um, China and the US and China. Um, we had a question from an anonymous um, participant on the call asking, is this basically, how does this pandemic affect um, relations between the US and China? And Raj via email had asked, you know, um, does China's dominance significantly change post COVID-19? It was a really good and important question. Um, and, uh, and, and on that, I can't answer. Um, let's, let's go to 30,000 feet for a second. Um, I wrote a few weeks ago about the thesis of Michelle Gelfand, who's a professor of political science at the University of Maryland, who divides cultures in the world um, as roughly between tight and loose cultures. So tight cultures tend to be top-down authority, uh, very rule-bound, rule-abiding, very uh, much more collectivist, um, uh, and generally orderly and, and um, authoritarian-like, even if they're not necessarily authoritarian. Uh, loose cultures are very individualistic, uh, non-collectivist, uh, not particularly rule-abiding, uh, very independent, um, and not particularly orderly. It turns out that tight cultures uh, seem to be able to deal with a pandemic better than loose cultures. Tight cultures being China, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, by example, loose cultures, um, uh, America, Italy, Spain. Uh, uh, and so in the short term, uh, yes, maybe uh, China will be stealing a march on us here. Um, I would say US-China relations and China's ability to kind of lead the world uh, instead of the US after this, it will depend on many things. But I'll tell you one thing it won't depend on. China will not be leading the world after this. If it thinks that it can lead the world by sending people masks while still masking the truth of where this virus came from. There are a lot of stories out there right now from not crazy conspiratorial news sites, but ones that say this is an important question we need to know the answer to and we don't know the answer to. But we need to know the answer where this virus started. Did it leak by accident? Uh, from uh, China's uh, lab in, in Wuhan that was studying coronaviruses, as some stories suggest? Or did it come from the wet market and cross over from wildlife uh, to humans? Either way, China's habits of um, uh, trading in global wildlife, um, uh, because people think they have magical powers and sexual potency or whatever, man, that's got to stop, um, number one. But number two, people, I want to know where this started. And China owes uh, itself an answer, owes its people an answer. 
it owes the world an answer. They did not behave well when this started. They tried to cover it up. They didn't share information. They censored and reproached a doctor who was one of the first to tell Chinese about it, and he ultimately died from the virus. So I don't think, you know, one thing that you really learn about leadership, um, which leaders stand out and which ones don't, and this applies to countries and presidents, is leaders who trust their people with the truth. Leaders who don't trust their people with the truth, and I think that's one of Donald Trump's great failings. Um, uh, I mean, this is a guy who for a month has been telling us anyone who wants a test can get a test. Well, it's not true today. It surely wasn't true 30 days ago. He did not trust people with the truth because I don't want optimism from him. I do want, I want the truth and I want hope, but I want hope grounded in truth. And I don't want optimism uh, uh, from him. And so um, uh, I think, and, and, and that applies to countries. You cannot lead the world. And, and if you go back and, and you ask Michael, how did America become the world leader? And what did it mean that we led the world for the last you know, 100 years or so? What did we do to lead the world? We did three things. We offered three things. One is um, we were the coalition builder. We were the people who built the coalitions, whether you know, against um, uh, uh, the Nazis or whether against um, communism, authoritarianism. We were the coalition builder. Or after World War II to build the global institutions. Second, we were always seen as a source of truth, uh, a source of science a source of the best data. If the American said it, if it came from America, it must be true. And lastly, we were a source of aid and comfort to people. So we provided coalition building, we provided aid and comfort, and we provided truth. And today, Donald Trump is providing none of those things. Donald Trump's America, but I'm not sure China is either. And those are the three keys, I think, to global leadership. Right. Now, um, a lot of questions have come in on this topic. And Tom, in your column, you talked about a lot of things that America should focus on post-pandemic, like renewable energy and rural broadband. But a lot of readers want to know, and people on this call want to know, what is this what does this crisis say about the need for a different healthcare system, a different social safety net? How important is that? And what do you think are the most important things to figure out and work on once things have settled down? It's a very good question, Michael, and, and a close reading of my column would note that I said, of course we need improved public health care and many other things. These are, I said, these are three things most people may not have thought about. So I was actually focusing on things that I thought hadn't really been written about. Um, but there's no question, and I think this will be Joe Biden's uh, greatest advantage going into this election and will be Trump's greatest weakness. Joe Biden can run in this election on expanding Obamacare and adding a public option in the wake of uh, uh, this crisis. And I'm all for that. Um, uh, Trump will have to run explaining why he has been trying to kill Obamacare, doing everything he can to kill it without having any alternative. So it'll be Biden, Obamacare plus a public option versus Trump killing Obamacare with no alternative. And I think that stark difference is where Trump is most vulnerable. So uh, I was just trying to suggest in my column some things that people weren't thinking about that weren't obvious. And I consider uh, expanding Obamacare, fixing it, expanding it, and adding a public option as the necessary minimum that has to come out of this crisis to make us more resilient and more, more productive. All right. Now, Merle um, from Tel Aviv asked, uh, what industries do you think will become especially significant in the post-coronavirus period? What was the first, what, what will become? Uh, which industries? Industries, industries. Um, uh, well, there's no question that in the short run, so my view of pandemics, what I've learned is that they do three things. They accelerate every existing trend they expose every existing weakness and they stress um, any fractures you have. You know, they expose any weakness or strength, I should say, and they stress um, any weakness. So um, uh, what, what were the trends going into this? Distance learning um, and distance work. And I think this pandemic in the near term 
will really um, uh, accelerate distance learning and distance work. Um, Andrew and I and Michael, we've never done this before. But you know what? This is kind of cool. This is a lot of fun. Um, we may want to make this a, a weekly thing. Um, and uh, God willing, when the economy comes back, maybe we can even sell ads on it and help support the New York Times, you know? And so I think we're discovering like a lot of new things like, like that. But I'll tell you what else is, you know, one of, in, in my work in India over the years, um, one of the reasons I like to um, uh, go meet Indian innovators is that um, you find people there working on the hardest problems. That is, how can I provide, for instance, health insurance, sort of minimal health insurance for a dollar a day or 100 rupees a day, whatever the number is. And what I find interesting about those Indian innovators is that when you when they come up with a solution, like that can scale globally, you know. And so one of the things I'd be looking at um, is uh, because there's enormous innovation happening around this thing every day now. And, um, and crises are uh, fertile times for new companies to start. Um, Intel, Microsoft, they all started in recessions. Uh, and I think this is going to be an enormously uh, fruitful time for finding low cost healthcare solutions. You know, we're basically in a race between Moore's law and COVID's law. So Moore's law coined by Gordon Moore in 1965 said the speed and power of microchips will double every roughly two years and the price will stay roughly flat. And it's, it's a proxy for innovation and the fact that we can now innovate at an exponential rate. And um, COVID's law of course is the exponential power of a virus. And um, I, I have a lot of hope for, for Moore's Law, um, being able to keep up with this thing and that giving us the most important thing we need now, Michael, um, is a, uh, some kind of therapy that takes death off the table. Just as that cocktail of antivirals took death off the table for people who had AIDS, if we could get um, antivirals or some therapy that said, if you get this virus, it's not a death sentence. That would be such an intermediate boost to the economy between now and when we get a, a actual vaccine. And I know people are working on it and I hope and pray. We've had a lot of bad news here. We're actually due for some good surprises. All right. um, we've talked a lot about sort of the changes in uh, mindset that um, can have been happening and should happen um, because of the pandemic. But uh, Dale asks via email about a pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, tough question. Do you think the rich would agree to pay for uh, pay more in taxes to help um, sort of fund the transformation that you've been talking about here? Well, they're just going to have to, and there's just no question about it. And um, uh, if they don't. <clears throat> As I said, I go back to what happened after 2008, um, Occupy Wall Street and um, uh, the Tea Party, they will be a knitting circle compared to the social unrest you will see. Um, we can't leave that many people in our society hurting. Um, you know, that said, I, you know, uh, I think the size of this is so big that, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know what that tax hike, how big it is, you know, compared to uh, the size of the challenge. But we, I know it's, I know not only it has to be on the table, it will be on the table. The rich will have to pay more. But I, I hope people don't stop there because um, I don't just want to tax our way out of this because I don't think you can actually do that. I want to make sure we're innovating our way out of it too. And that's what I wrote that column. Who are the people coming up with new innovations to make more people productive, innovators, opportunities, so we can grow out of this, not just tax out of this. Taxing our way out of it is necessary, but it will not be sufficient. Right. Tom. Andrew. I want to say thank you. Uh, we, we, we've come to uh, uh, the end of our, our session, uh, unfortunately, because we could do this for forever, and I, I could talk to you forever, and I, I just want to thank you uh, as uh, my friend and colleague for spending time with us and trying to help us sort through this. Everybody's trying to make sense of it. And um, uh, I think you've given us a lot of really, really great ideas. And I do hope we can uh, do this again. Uh, I, I don't know about weekly, but we'll, maybe we can try. 
Um, I also want to. I also want to thank Michael uh, for, for for being a part, an important part of this conversation, and uh, all of you who've joined us uh, on the phone and sent in your questions. Uh, we'll have a replay available, as I said, on uh, the Dealbook email in the morning tomorrow morning, as well as on social and on nytimes.com. And uh, also a quick reminder uh, that uh, you can find out about the full slate of digital events that the New York Times is uh, putting together. Um, there, there are different events taking place virtually every day these days. Uh, you can visit uh, timesevents.nytimes.com. Uh, for now, again, I want to thank Tom and Michael and all of you. And uh, please stay safe and most of all healthy out there. Thanks so much.